and welcome to the sixth meeting of the Health and Sport Committee of 2018. Uh, can I ask everyone please to ensure that mobile phones are on silent and uh, note that we are filming and recording uh, the proceedings so there's no need for anyone else to do likewise. Um, we have received apologies this morning from David Stewart, MSP, and we start the morning's uh, formal proceedings with our roundtable evidence session on NHS corporate governance. I'd like to welcome uh, all our guests who've joined us uh, for this uh, roundtable and um, uh, reflect on the, uh, res the responses we received to our survey uh, and our call for uh, evidence to the inquiry. I think the best way to start is for me to introduce myself. I'm Lewis MacDonald, MSP, the convener of the committee and an MSP for North East Scotland. And if I could ask everyone uh, to introduce themselves around the table. Ash. Good morning, I'm Ash Denham, I'm the Deputy Convener and I am the MSP for Edinburgh Eastern. Morning, I'm Kenrick Lloyd-Jones and I'm here representing the Allied Health Professions Federation Scotland uh, and I'm employed by the Chartered Society of Physiotherapy in Scotland. Good morning, I'm Miles Briggs, I'm Conservative MSP for Lothian Region and Conservative Spokesman for Health and Sport. Good uh, morning, I'm Bill Scott, Director of Policy for Inclusion Scotland. We are a disabled people's organisation. Good morning everyone, I'm Alex Cole Hamilton, Lib Dem MSP for Edinburgh Weston and my party's health support person. Uh, good morning, I'm Brian Montgomery. Um, I'm currently an independent healthcare consultant, uh, but I'm here by dint of a number of previous roles I've held, including being general practitioner, uh, trust and divisional medical director in NHS Lothian, uh, board Medical Director in NHS Fife and actually a spell as Interim Chief Executive in NHS Fife. Uh, good morning, I'm Jenny Gilruth, the MSP for Mid Fife and Glenrothes. Good morning, I'm Emma Harper, I'm South Scotland MSP. Hello, my name's Rachel Cackett and I'm the Policy Advisor for the Royal College of Nursing in Scotland. I'm Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. Uh, good morning, Ivan McKee, MSP for Glasgow Proven. Good morning, I'm Claire Sweeney, Associate Director, Audit Scotland. Good morning, Brian Whittle, uh, South of Scotland, MSP. Uh, good morning, Sandra White, MSP for Glasgow, Kelvin. My name is Richie Shah, head of the Policy and Research Department at the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations. Thank you very much. And can I say also that we uh, uh, issued a survey to members of NHS boards when we issued our call for evidence in January, and we'll hear more from some of those board members uh, at a future meeting. Uh, but I'd like to thank all the people who responded. 47% of board members responded, which was uh, a very good level of response and which we really appreciate. Uh, clearly, there are a number of issues on which our witnesses today have a high level of expertise. And uh, I wonder if I could ask Brian Whittle uh, to uh, put the first question in relation to uh, uh, the boards of health. And Thank you, Kadina. Uh, good morning to the panel. I think, can I just start, uh, is there a need for a greater role uh, for patients in the, um, in the public and the third sector uh, in NHS governance? Is there, is there a distance between uh, the, the boards for, and, and the general public that uh, needs to be closed? Excellent. Happy to, <laughs> <laughs> Happy to kick off. Um, yes, we produce uh, an overview report of the NHS in Scotland each year, and uh, we produced the last report in October last year. And in that report, we mentioned that um, there was a need for a very different conversation with the public um, about the way that um, the health system is operating and some of the difficult decisions that now have to be made given the financial pressures. Um, and the integration of health and social care, so a very changed landscape. So we would say, yes, there is a need for a, um, a more open and honest conversation with the public about the direction of travel for health and social care services in Scotland. Bill. Yes, uh, we, we would also agree with that. Um, we firmly believe in the findings and recommendations of the Christie Commission that service users have to be involved in the management and governance of the services that they receive, um, because that's the only way to bring about the sort of transformation in those services to actually make sure that they meet the needs of the people that use them on a day-to-day -day basis. So you would say patients, I would say people with long-term health conditions, dis disabilities, etc., who rely on health services on, on a more frequent basis than uh, you know, general members of the population, they have to be 
really involved in service planning um, and, and commissioning, uh, as well as the other aspects of NHS governance. Brian? Uh, yes, and I would further extend it and make the distinction between those who are active service users, if you like, but the wider population. And I think that particularly relates to the point that Claire made, is looking forward, we're currently in an environment that's only going to get uh, greater, where the number of options, the number of opportunities open to us are far greater than those we can currently afford. Uh, and so there are some very difficult choices, some very difficult discussions that lie ahead. Uh, and I don't think it's for the professions or the boards indeed to make those decisions. Uh, I think these decisions have to be made collaboratively with the wider public. Rachel. Um, picking up on, on Brian's point, um, some of you may remember that the Royal College of Nursing did some work a couple of years ago on performance management and how to measure success in the health service and in that similarly made the point that both Claire and Brian have made about the difficult decisions that are required and the need to come to those decisions in partnership between those who are using the services, those who may need to use the services in the future and those who are delivering them, which would include the members of the Royal College of Nursing. So I would absolutely underline that. I think that the heart of the response that we gave in writing went to the point that we now have a number of different systems at play. And I think that comes across as well when we're talking about how we're engaging third sector organisations and how we're engaging the public. So if you look across the integration landscape and the legislation that was put in for integration, there are, now colleagues in the third sector can say better than I can whether they think it's working well or not, but there are legislative frameworks around that engagement at an integration level for those, for those functions that have been delegated down to a local level. We then have a different system within NHS boards and we now have emerging regional agendas where maybe some of that engagement is still far less clear because we're at such an early stage of what that regional system might look like. So I think we have quite a mixed um, market, if you like, in how people can engage. I don't think that always makes it the easiest thing to do. And I think the, the key thing that we need to be looking throughout this uh, issue on governance and how we do that well and how we engage people has to come down to the point of transparency and clarity because decision-making and the accountability for decision-making, particularly when we're dealing with issues that are um, around clinical safety, for example, or the quality of care, we have to be absolutely clear from the very beginning where those decisions are sitting and who's responsible for them. Thank you. Can I? Um, I, th I think there possibly needs to be some distinction between when we're talking about the, in the inclusion of the public. There's at the one level there are service user organisations. There are then service users, and then there are... The, the general public who are potential service users and how you engage and involve those may depend on the kinds of decision making you're looking for um, so that for example uh, a consultation to the public might be on uh, particular proposals whereas when you're looking at the design and delivery of services you may be involving service user organizations who may bring the degree of expertise required to um, speak on behalf of service users in that field thank you very much this year we are picking up a lot of frustrations in the third sector and in the people that the third sector supports about just when they have brought issues to uh, the governance of NHS, uh, that these issues are not followed up, they're not treated with the same level of respect and uh, equity that uh, other decisions makers might be afforded. And I think, you know, the overall context here, and this picks up on Kenrick's point, is that we are now in a, in a situation in Scotland where we are, we've got an ambition towards a much more open government culture. And indeed, Scottish government has made commitments um, in that for as part of the International Open Government Partnership. So the international spotlight is on Scotland at the moment as a pioneer in open government around these kinds of issues. And the issues are participation, accountability, and transparency. One of the things we have picked up is um, in the field of participatory budgeting, where things have been working quite well, when the general public, including uh, service users and organisations um, are given a genuine say and they can see how their say influences the decisions that are made and how those decisions are then made, even if the people who, don't, who put in their views and put in their perspectives don't get the outcome they want, they are happy with the process. So if you talk about uh, very stark uh, decisions such as shutting a hospital, now that's politically a very difficult decision to make. But if people can see how that decision is made, what, trade, what the trade-offs were, and they can genuinely feel that their views were heard, not just individually, but the discussions they've had with each other are heard publicly, then they are much happier with that. And that's the evidence that we found from participatory budgeting around the UK. So I think that's, that's something that certainly can apply here. 
Thank you very much, Brian. Yeah. Just, just a quick follow-up to that then. I mean, as you see, we have this ambition then to, to be more open and more transparent and, and to, to, to allow more people into the decision-making process. But, but do we have the system, a practical system in place that will allow that to happen? Or if we don't, what, what, where do we have to change? Yes, again, please. We do. We have a, a practical system in place. It's the Open Government Partnership Action Plan. And this is a mechanism which uh, has to be designed jointly with citizens and civil society um, and government in each country. Now, Scotland at the moment is, is coming to the end of a, a pioneer uh, action plan where it made five commitments, including around financial transparency, around uh, participation, around, uh, um, around opening up the way in which the national performance framework was, uh, is being developed and so on. And, uh, this action plan, it's very much a first step, but there is now a mechanism for moving on to a two-year action plan from August onwards. And so the opportunity we have now is a, quite a clear mechanism with international guidelines which can improve participation, transparency and accountability in how decisions are made that affect people uh, with a lot of uh, uh, tools, techniques, resources that are available internationally to use on that. So, and that's certainly something which uh, at SCVO we are supporting. We're helping to mobilize citizens and civil society around. And so we have got the resources uh, available for that internationally. Thanks very much, Claire. We would say there's a, <clears throat> there's a potential disconnect sometimes between the overall policy ambition and how that's being realised on the ground. We look at, across the public sector in Scotland, so we see differences in terms of how some of those policies are being applied. I think there are some interesting challenges thrown up with things like participatory budgeting and self-directed support and what that looks like in a health context. So I think there's an easier fit for local authorities. You could argue in an, in an IJB world that, that fits reasonably well. I think there are still questions about how that's been applied in a health context. So it's certainly something that we, we're going to pay a bit of attention to over the next little while. We've, we've published reports on, on self-directed support in the past that have highlighted some of those tensions. Um, so I absolutely think it's something we need to we need to keep looking at. We are doing a little bit of work around community empowerment um, with other scrutiny partners, and uh, what that's revealing to us is the areas that do this really really well have spent a long time and have invested in having a really good relationship with the local community. So when times are difficult and difficult decisions need to be made doesn't necessarily make that really easy, but it means that there's a there's an environment where that engagement's expected. You know, there are people willing to participate in that discussion and there's a level of trust that's being built up. And that's not the case in all areas. Thank you very much. Jenny. And good morning to the panel. Um, Claire Sweeney, you spoke there about that disconnect between the policy ambition and what actually happens in reality. And picking up on Bill Scott's point with regard to service users needing to be involved from the beginning in terms of service delivery, when we drill down into the statistics and we look at the demographics of board membership at the moment, um, a majority of respondents, 65 or 64 percent rather, were age 55 and over. Uh, a third were aged between 35 and 54. One respondent was aged between 25 and 34, and there was no one in the 18 to 24 uh, category. How do we then reach out to other age groups and how do we get a greater diversity on our boards to make sure that all the public are involved in that process, not just um, a very small section of society who might be involved in other things as well? Who would like to start? Bill? Well, you know, there's a desperate underrepresentation of disabled people yeah. on all public boards, uh, including NHS boards. And I think we need to do far more. Again, when uh, chairs of boards, uh, conveners of boards were, were asked, you know, whether diversity and equality were primary considerations when they were recruiting new board members, it wasn't uppermost in their, in their minds. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we do need to, to have boards that represent everyone in society. There's always going to be, you know, it's going to be finding some people to come forward um, and, and some in some groups. Uh, so that you, when we talk about community empowerment, it should be about developing the potential of individuals to represent groups um, within boards, uh, etc. Because, you know, lived experience can take you so far. Um, you know what affects you. But what you need to know is how it affects 
the group that you're there to represent. And that c it can affect you know, people in, in different ways, different impairment groups, etc. And particularly young people are underrepresented. And I think, again, it's not that young people uh, don't care about the health service. It's that they probably use it less frequently than uh, older people um, and maybe think, well, it's somebody else is going to do this for me. But you know, when you take issues to young people, they often become very politically engaged and, and are willing to serve and, and do their bit. So again, there's a bit there about how much have we done as a society to actually reach out to young people. How do we get them interested in being involved, involved in health boards? Because I'm sure that it's not just who, who was recruited, it's also who applied that you're going to have to look at. And if you want to make you know, broaden out the applications to be on boards, et cetera, if, if there are public places available, then you, you really are going to have to target certain groups in society that are underrepresented and make sure that they feel that, that they, their service will be valued and that their voice will be heard in the process. Otherwise, you know, they're walking into a room with a group of people that they've never seen before and have no idea what their police are, but they know that they're all older than them. And that, you know, if you're, if you're the sole young person in the room, it, it must be a very, very difficult situation. Thanks very much. Brian? I, I think there's an important distinction to be made between being on boards and being actively and meaningfully involved in board-led mechanisms. Uh, I think one of the dangers is that we run the risk if we try to make boards as representative as possible. We end up with cumbersome Bo uh, cumbersome bodies, but not only that, bodies where many of the people around the table are only interested in a fraction of the agenda. Um, and that has been a problem, certainly in my own experience on boards uh, over a number of years. Uh, and I think the real challenge is less about who's around the board table, important though that is in terms of the general representation, certainly for a territorial board, but it's about what sits underneath that board and how that board then uh, empowers and responds to those substructures. Uh, I think that's where you do need the very specific, very focused, very knowledgeable input uh, from a whole variety of stakeholders. So the, so the question of the balance of yeah. diverse and representative as opposed to perhaps you're saying skills and experience, is that essentially... And while I think a board does have to have a good cross-representation, I think it would be unreasonable and unrealistic to expect to have every, everything represented around the board's table. What for me is more important is what happens beyond the board table uh, and how the board table then responds to that. Rachel? I mean, uh, one of the things that I would note is that those people who have responded to your survey and who currently take the role of non-exec directors are doing an enormous public service, and I think it's, a, it's an enormous job. Um, the work that we've been doing recently, looking across the, the papers that go out to boards and then to IJBs, remembering now many of these non-execs will have a dual role on two different governance functions. I mean, the papers run to hundreds and hundreds of pages. Um, so it's an enormous task that we ask of people when they're doing this public service. And I think it's important to acknowledge that, um, whether it's the right mix or not at the moment. And work that we did, um, going back to what I was talking about previously on measuring success, we commissioned a number of uh, fairly eminent people in Scotland to write some articles for us. And one of them was looking at uh, major service failures. And one of the issues that was brought up for us there was the importance of diversity in boards to ensure that there is sufficient challenge to decisions as they're going across. Uh, too, much, too much of the same tends to result in decisions that maybe are not, are not challenged well enough. But I'd go back to maybe what Bill was saying, um, and this reminds me of conversations we had many years ago in the Parliament about NHS boards and how they should be configured, which is the importance of making sure that there is, on the one hand, lots of opportunities for people to have genuine participation and engagement in decision making, which may not mean a board seat, but that where we, are, where we, where we develop that, we are developing, if you like, the grassroots to be able to, to, to move into those roles at other points. Um, and so that diversity will, will hopefully come through. But I, I do think we have to acknowledge the, the task that we now set people who take non-exec roles. And we don't yet even know where that will sit with the regional planning agenda as it, as it emerges. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, just to, to echo Rachel's points, I think that's really important. The, the, the size of the, the ask is, is significant. Um, I think we've got a job to do, though, to make that 
seem doable for people, that it is possible for younger folk to actually be involved in those, for different groups that are not represented in the way we would like them to be, to, to actually say that this is something you can do, it is a possible job. Um, and I think sometimes some of the pressures that sit around the, the health system particularly can, can put people off, the task can seem impossible. Um, and so we see we've got quite an important role, the auditors particularly, of every single public body in Scotland to be there to help, to support. Um, so if there are questions from non-execs around finances, we can offer training, we can help to, to support people's development in the areas where they feel a little bit weaker. So it, it is possible to do this because it is a huge public service. It needs to be made as easy as possible for people. Thank you. Kenrick. Um, I fully recognise uh, some of the limitations around a representative model. I, I'm, I'm here and I'm representing the allied health professions, which brings together 13 different professions within health and social care. Uh, I understand the limitations, but at the same time, I think that there is a way in which you can include the various interests to ensure that you're making good decisions. And, and we certainly, for the last decade, have said that there ought to be allied health professional uh, re representation and inclusiveness in decision making because they cover every aspect of care from, from intensive care and accident emergency through to, to primary care and, and, and social care. Uh, and also they're bringing something of a fresh perspective, uh, particularly around uh, the integration and around a biopsychosocial model of care and that uh, they have uh, something to contribute and we'd like to see that included and we think that the best way of that happening is through better guidance to have those people included. But it does take investment in that leadership because no one person can know everything about every one of those uh, individual professions without an investment in that leadership so that whoever is, 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 is in a representative role has uh, uh, some degree of accountability and the need to engage in the people in which they're there to support and promote. Okay. Yeah, just taking on board, uh, I appreciate what Dr Montgomery was saying, but I do find it somewhat startling that there is nobody in the country in the 18 to 24 age bracket, particularly given that this is the year of Scotland's young people. Um, I think we need to have those voices on the table, um, whether you accept that's at board level or not. I, I think that if you look at current board membership, they are not representative of the country more broadly. There is an overt emphasis on those in the retired section in terms of age brackets, and I think that that could be detrimental to service delivery because, going back to what Bill Scott said, if they're not at the table, how can they impact upon the decision? that are made. Um, in terms of training then, only 10% of respondents that we heard from said that the recruitment process always led to the right people being appointed to the board. And some respondents call for a, a more national approach to training and induction um, in terms of a consistency to approach. And, and I suppose that alludes to what Claire Sweeney spoke about with regards to the complexities involved in this process, which might put perhaps younger people off. I don't necessarily accept that myself. I think it can be a struggle for, for any age group getting to grips with some of the technicalities involved in that role. Um, but do you agree then we need a national programme in terms of training? Uh, you first and then Claire. I think, uh, you know, Right now in the charity sector, when we're thinking about governance quite closely, as you can imagine, a huge amount of scrutiny on governance, and with that comes training and awareness of how, uh, what, you know, the, the, the skill set you bring to it. It's not just the, the background, but it's also the awareness of what you do as uh, somebody who's part of a governance of an organisation. So while we're talking about uh, having a balance in the boards, um, people need to know that uh, the, the the weight of responsibility that's going to be on them once they're around the board. And I don't think we do enough around that, you know, around uh, um, uh, supporting people to understand their governance role and the implications it can have for them as well. So w way beyond, uh, you know, giving people 100 page reports a day before a meeting, if that's, I'm not saying that's what's happening, but if that kind of thing happens, it does certainly happen in some sectors. Um, you, you know, th people need to be able to give an, the support and the awareness of, of what they're getting into. And I think part of this might also be, the trick here might be rather than expecting us to put all the weight of governance on the NHS boards, if we can somehow open up uh, the, 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 the role of governance of health services and NHS trusts uh, through wider mechanisms which involve the public, so that less of the emphasis on decisions is solely put on who's around the table in the boards. And I think we might actually have a more balanced system overall in general, and then it makes things like training a lot easier. Clear. So, so yes, I think more does need to be done to help 
to support all age groups. Um, I think that's absolutely true, and clearly there's an ask. You get that from the survey responses. There's a demand there for that. I think one of the things we would <clears throat> focus on um, around the financial skills, we often see that that is something people worry about when they're joining the board. So I think there is more to be done around that. So there are some courses that are available to help support people. Uh, one of the other things we really look for um, is the respectful challenge that the non-execs need to give around some quite complex issues. Um, so again, support for people with their confidence when they're joining a board and they're quite new to it, to be able to, to take on that role. And sometimes we hear the feedback from new non-execs that actually being new in and being able to ask the, what might seem quite a silly, quite a basic question that's not been asked before is a really, really valuable thing. But giving people the confidence to be able to challenge in that way is a good thing. So there's a whole set of technical skills, but also some softer skills that people need support with. So I would definitely recognise that there's, there's more to be done to support people, for sure. Thanks. Brian? Uh, yeah, I, I echo what everyone has said, and I think it's very important that round the table you have that variety and breadth of perspectives. But my sense is that non-exec colleagues in particular also need uh, and value the ability to sort of see the bigger picture and understand the bigger picture and there's a huge potential induction process that they need to go through to allow them to get that degree of confidence. Um, I had a, the experience a few years ago in Fife uh, as, as one of the two boards that had an elected board for a while. Uh, and that was a fascinating process, not least because uh, it almost felt like the pause button was pressed uh, in that uh, overnight a significant number of non-executive directors who had over the years built up comfort and confidence and experience disappeared and were replaced by a number of individuals who were voted on by the local public. They, by their own admission, found it difficult because while they understood their particular interest, their particular perspective, they found it very difficult to slot into the big picture. They found it very difficult to offer these challenges into areas that they weren't comfortable with, for example. So I think uh, the, the elected boards have obviously been paused and, and we've moved on without them. But I do think that there is a lot more about uh, training and induction for board members. And I think the other thing that's very important is that it's not just about the board that they are appointed to. I think it's very important that they have an understanding of the NHS in Scotland, particularly as we're starting to look at things like regional issues much more closely. So I think the training, the induction has to be more than just their local geography. Thank you. Well, <coughs> yeah. Yes, please. Um, one of the things, um, the Scottish Government funded us to establish a Highland Localisation and Employment Project, which was actually established to do the very things that we're talking about, which is to work with local disabled people and the groups that represent them, either organisations of disabled people or organisation for them, to actually develop the potential of disabled people to participate in decision making both in community partnerships and uh, in health uh, uh, governance. Um, so the idea is there, and I, I, I think you have to start even before the training and develop, you know, to actually build the confidence, which is what you said, Claire. You need to build the confidence of people to, be, to, to think that they're capable of doing it. And that might mean that you start well before the board stage and try and get them involved in other um, you know, activities where decision making is involved. Now, we did a mapping e e exercise in Highland, um, and the hierarchy there is the NHS board, the Integrated Joint Monitoring uh, Committee, the Health and Social Care Partnership, as it was, uh, the Adult Strategic Commissioning Groups, and then the Improvement Groups. And the only groups that disabled people were represented on were the improvement groups. And they've all been halted and become task-focused groups, which means no new disabled people are being recruited to them. So there's very little opportunity to develop people to move on. And, and it doesn't seem they're moving into any of the other uh, governance groups. And that limits people's ability to then have that bigger picture, build up the knowledge that they need. And we, we would agree that they shouldn't just be there to represent an interest group. They should be there to represent everyone, but with the specific knowledge of an interest group that they can bring to the table and say, what you're planning to do won't work for the group that I represent or a part of the group that I represent for these reasons. 
so that the lived experience is part of the, what they bring to the table and it is an asset uh, that can be used rather than that it's a limitation on their ability to make decisions. So very much agree that you know, a lot of development work is needed, but we need to prise open some of the other decision-making bodies within NHS boards to be able to promote people later to, to have a, a, a larger role as non-executive directors. Ivan McKee, I think, had a question yeah, on non executive Thanks, uh, thanks convener, and thanks to everybody for, <clears throat> for coming along and taking part this morning. Um, it was just to follow up on, in a bit more detail, on some of the specifics that uh, Jenny Gorruth's been talking about, around about the, uh, the, the training aspect of this. Certainly, um, in my experience dealing with the health board, there's very often a situation you see where um, the execs have got the whip hand and the, the non-execs aren't challenging to anything like the extent that, that they possibly should. And I think other members have probably had the same experience in their relations with their, with their own health boards. And it's, it's something, in my experience, you see it in the private sector as well. I mean, there's lots of examples where um, non-exec, for your told execs to account has led to, led to some, um, some disasters occurring. Um, so I suppose really just to drill down into that a little bit more, my question is, to what extent do non-exec members understand what the job is that they're doing? Because being a non-exec director is, is a job in itself. And to what extent do the health board execs understand that, the job of the non-execs to hold them to account? And what specific induction and training is that's in place at the moment to facilitate that? Or are we just kind of throwing people in and hoping that they sink or swim? Who would like to... There. Yes, so there, there is a, an induction programme for new non-execs. Uh, we contribute to that through talking about um, the financial position across the whole of Scotland, and it's a it's a, an induction session for for all public board members. Um, so it's not just for the for the health system. Um, I think when we when we go around to boards, when we go around to audit committees, the thing that worries us when we see it as if there's not sufficient challenge there so I think absolutely I can say that that's not the case. it's not as healthy as we would like it to be in all areas um, there are some areas that need to work a bit harder to make sure that the non-execs are challenging that they're given the right information um, speaks to Rachel's point about the sheer volume of information that people are expected to absorb that so they can fulfill their role on the board um, I would say that the local audit teams will challenge around that where they see it so it's something that will be reported through the local audit reports um, we're very keen in, in all of our work but certain particular pieces of work such as our role, uh, report on the, the role of boards to emphasise the importance of that scrutiny role. It needs to be respectful but it needs to be a challenge role. Um, we've also commented before um, about the where there have been major failings in the public sector, it does tend to be governance related at the heart of it. Um, and one of the healthy signs is a, is a respectful but challenging relationship between the chief exec and the chair particularly. So that's something, again, that the auditors will look at in detail. So yes, we see it in places, but it's by no means across the whole, the whole picture. That's true. Rachel. I think it's fair to say that the, the changing landscape that everyone finds themselves in at the moment around health and social care is also a challenge for the directors generally. And one of the pieces of work that the RCN has been involved in for a number of years is supporting those nurses who have been appointed to integrated joint boards in a governance role, because it's a brand new role. And one of the things I think we have to be aware of is that whilst we may be very used, if you like, to the traditional NHS board governance processes that we have, the integrated joint boards are quite a different thing, because we're bringing together two quite different cultures on how decisions are made and how decisions are reached. So one of the pieces of work that we've been doing ourselves to support nursing leaders is to work with nurses who have been appointed to those seats to help them uh, work through what that difference is, because it's a real learning curve to how to go into that very new environment in a seat, for example, where in an NHS board and an executive nurse director has a voting seat and in an integrated joint board they don't, where the, the, the way in which decisions are being made is quite different and the way in which the expectations that are set on that clinical expertise. And I think we keep coming back, whether we're talking from Bill's point about ensuring that the expertise of people who are experiencing a disability is heard on a, on a board. Similarly, from our perspective, the, the clinical and um, quality and assurance role that a nurse has in that leadership role is also expertise that has to be heard and taken on board in the right way. So I think we're all finding our feet slightly differently here. I think non-execs is a very particular point, but I don't think it's, 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 it's limited to the non-execs on the boards. 
Brian. The other thing I'd, I'd like to highlight is that, um, I mean, as an executive director, I expected and welcomed the challenge and found it incredibly useful. Much of that challenge took place long before it got to the board table, despite the fact it came from non-execs and others. And in many ways, it echoes my earlier point about the, 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 the success of a board in many ways relates to its committee structure uh, and the various activities that feed into and inform that board. So I would expect, as an exec director, um, that that sort of challenge would be taking, through, taking place through the committee structures, uh, but also development sessions set up. And the advantage of the development sessions is that it's then uh, they tend to be more uni-subject. Uh, you can then engage a wider degree of stakeholders. So, for example, we would get clinicians along to meet with uh, board non-execs and others. Um, if it was uh, helpful to them, we would bring the local politicians in as well, so that as part of this discussion would take place before it got to the board table, the challenge would be there, the challenge would be responded to, uh, and I would argue that the quality of discussion was probably better than you would have been able to achieve around the board table, simply because you had that flexibility in being able to augment uh, the participants. Thanks very much. Sandra, I think you had a follow-up on I want a, a quick follow-up on that. Having my time on the audit committee, when we were looking at uh, various boards, particularly in the college sector, uh, there was lots of things come up and it was actually quite <coughs> concerning. Uh, I just want to drill down perhaps slightly. People have accused um, boards of you know, just moving insiders from one board to another. And from my experience on the audit committee, people tend to be the same people and they, they knew each other. Uh, is that a problem? And particularly when you're looking at rural areas, because this is one of the ones I wanted to pick up on as well, uh, the number of members on each board, it doesn't actually equate to the population of each area. So if you're living up in the islands, for instance, uh, you've got 41 members in that, res that respect, 14 from the Orkney, uh, Shetland and the Western Isles, quite a small area, so that obviously people I would assume would know each other. Uh, but then when you go down to NHS Lanarkshire, for instance, they've got 14 members on a board, but they've got a population of 652,000 people. So I just wondered what the thoughts are, and is it a small pocket of people that has been used in health boards in certain areas, and should it actually equate to the population of the areas that they, they, they cover? Clear. So um, the recent uh, induction process for all non-execs in Scotland, the last session, um, I was it, it was quite in, it was quite interesting. It felt a little bit different because there were more representatives from particularly rural areas, the islands in particular. It's something we're really interested in the extent to which um, some of these issues are not an NHS issue or an urban issue. Some of them are about real connections to and understanding all of the needs of the local population. Um, and it's a small anecdotal example, but I can, de I can definitely start to see more of that coming through, uh, particularly in some of the more rural areas. And I think um, the Islands Bill will have an impact here as well. It's something we're watching quite carefully. That, I think that sense of needing to be closer and have that connection to the population is starting to come through. I can't speak particularly for the NHS context, but we're certainly seeing that through the induction sessions, I would say. Any, any other thoughts on that? I'm you. In fact, Emma. Thank you, convener. Good morning, everybody. I'm interested in the allied health professionals, um, board membership and engagement. Um, I mean, I, I guess it looks like there is only nine out of 32 of the integrated joint boards that have an AHP director at the table. I mean, there's, it uh, remains quite uh, barren in the numbers, actually, that uh, AHPs are underrepresented. And I wonder if that would impact the ability to set forward some of the national like COPD guidance for implementing pulmonary rehab, for instance, because these ideas aren't getting shared or put forward across boards. So what would be, how would you then move forward AHPs in the boards? Well, I, th I think you, um, you, you phrased that perfectly well. I think that the allied health professions are in a position to recognise where a whole range of services can be improved through their involvement, whether it's through falls prevention, whether it's through COPD and respiratory care, whether it's around um, keeping people out of hospital, whether it's about getting people out of hospital quicker, all the major problems that are being faced by the NHS. And what there is, I believe, is just people don't know what they don't know. And 
So therefore, there's a potential there, but that potential isn't recognised. And I think it's the recognition of the potential is where the allied health professions feel frustrated because they know that they have potential solutions to so many aspects of care. And because we're talking about 13 different professions here, we're talking about a whole range of areas where they're, 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 they're involved in very much the same thing around the, the, uh, the assessment, diagnosis and treatment of people, but that they're coming at it from a perspective which is non-medical and therefore something different that they can bring to the table to improve services. And they believe that that message isn't well understood because their potential isn't well understood by those people who are outside of their professions. I, sh I should mention that I am the cross-party group convener for the lung health cross-party group, so I'm interested in physiotherapy and allied health professionals. It's, I mean, the government wants AHPs to be central to change, so if the AHPs are going to be central to change, and the fact that you're describing there's 13 different um, types of allied health professional, does that make it more difficult then when everybody's doing something really quite different? It's always going to be a challenge to, for any individual because each, that there is no such thing as an allied health profession. If you like, there are each, each of the professions are educated separately, but they are grouped together as the allied health professions. Um, often it's a term meaning they're not doctors and they're not nurses, but they have some clinical role. Um, and I think in that context, it's always a challenge for anybody to know every single the potential of each one of them. The importance, I think, the onus is on anybody taking on any kind of representative role in that or, or being a mouthpiece or, or sitting at a table where services are being designed is to ask their colleagues how they may have a role in, for example, whether it's respiratory care or getting people out of hospital or whether it's about um, preventative care in the community, whatever it happens to be, is, is then going back to the networks and facilitating those networks and investing in those networks and creating that collaborative culture, which is something the allied health professions are very good at. But I think it actually needs a great deal more investment to get the right leadership to shift services forward. Okay, thank you. Brian Montgomery. Thank you. Kenrick's uh, more or less made the point I was about to make, which was while I accept the uh, added value of having someone with a broad understanding of AHPs around the board table, that is of little consequence if you don't actually have the correct mechanisms down at the groups that are really making the decisions, the recommendations, making it happen. Uh, and so it's a bit like my earlier point that a lot of this is really about what happens beyond the board um, and how the board then responds to that. Uh, and I think, you know, I have as a medical director, I had exactly the same issue, that as one doctor, I could not hope to represent the entire breadth of the medical profession. But I took my advice from an assortment of ologists uh, and made sure I had my arguments sorted out by the time they got to the board. Uh, indeed, I took my advice not just from the doctors, but the whole clinical community. Uh, and I think that's the important thing, is that by the time the board is getting involved in the discussion, that breadth is there, that quality is there. Rachel. I think it comes back to the point that we were making in our written submission, which is when we're talking about corporate governance, we need to make sure we've got all parts of corporate governance on the table equally. And I think the clinical governance part of that is absolutely key. I would say looking at papers across different governance groups, there's a tendency at the moment in the climate we're in to very much focus on the financial governance and the extraordinary pressure that boards and IJBs and others are under to try to make end meet, ends meet um, in the face of the, the current demand that they, they, they have to meet. And actually, if we don't make sure that the clinical governance elements are up there alongside where the views of clinicians are being really clearly heard and that advice is then influencing those financial decisions, that's, I think, when we get into things being out of kilter. So how we ensure that those voices are heard, and I think it goes back to the points we were making earlier around the involvement of people who are service users or representatives of service users as well. We have to make sure that those mechanisms are really, really strong. So to Brian's point, the Clinical Governance Committee is a really important part of any uh, governance group, whether that's at an integrated joint board level or at an NHS board level or at the future at a regional level, because we have to make sure that diversity of voice is heard. 
however that governance then is set up in terms of the ultimate accountability. And that's the area where I think we could we could probably do more. I know that in our submission we were asking to, 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 to come back again to the guidance that's been written for clinical guidance for integrated joint boards. We're a couple of years now, two, three years now, into actually seeing what that looks like on the ground. We've moved from theory into practice. There are things that we need to learn. And I think they're the areas that we could really make things much, much stronger in terms of ensuring our entire corporate governance works well. Bro. Yeah. Um, I think the Health and Sports Committee's report last year actually pointed out that we need to invest in the very people that we want to be involved. So you, you made the same point, that if we expect people to represent a wide group, allied health professionals, disabled people, whoever, then you need to have some investment in those people to be able to do that job properly at any level of governance, but particularly at corporate gov governance level and on a board. And some people face barriers to even making those first steps. You know, disabled people and carers face barriers to being involved at all, because there might be physical barriers, there might be sensory barriers, um, there could be confidence barriers uh, based on you know, mental health issues, etc., that have to be overcome before they can take that first step. So they need support. Um, so in some instances, they'll need advocacy support to be able to take part in decision-making that affects their lives. For others, it will be developmental support to take that first step in, first, uh, in confidence that they're going to be supported um, to take part in decision-making. And then they can move on. And you know, that means that we have to think how, what are the barriers to people being involved I, I worked in an area of multiple deprivation for several years. There were many strong activists in that area who could have played a role in decision-making you know, uh, uh, within health boards, uh, not always at the health board level, but you know, in the locality, et cetera. But they needed, they needed to be developed to have that confidence. And I think there is something about recruitment processes for public bodies, et cetera, that is a barrier. Um, because we, we expect certain you know, levels of experience, running a business, etc. Well, you're not going to have that experience, but you might have run a local charity. You know, is that any less valuable than running a business? You know, if you've got that experience, you can bring to the table. I think we need to think through how we recruit public bodies so that we do fully represent all of society, and that includes a lot of people living in deprived areas who have little or no opportunity to participate and governance as well. Thanks. A number of witnesses have commented on levels or areas of uh, representation or activity other than the boards themselves. So, for example, there are public partnership forums, there are equivalent forums for staff and for service users. Uh, uh, do, do witnesses have a view on how uh, effective and useful those forums are in terms of providing a means for people to engage further at a, further, at a later step, or, or indeed in serving the function they're there to fulfil as it stands. Richard? I think we're still at the moment in a consultation focused model. So you'll have uh, uh, NHS boards uh, and, and other major public sector institutions, they will issue con consultations to individuals, and individuals will be asked to fill in their responses in these consultations, then it goes back into a black box and decisions get made and they may or may not feel as though they've been heard. So yes, we absolutely need to change the model. It needs to be less about uh, one, uh, many to one consultations, and it needs to be much more about deliberative uh, dis decisions and discussions. And that's why I think participation is quite key. So um, certainly, you know, we've, we've seen some really good ideas coming out from, for example, the, uh, the idea of having the panel of uh, uh, around social security, but these kind of things need to be developed to where they are genuinely involve conversations between people, and that's what that's why I raised the point about participatory budgeting earlier, because there that's an area where uh, there's practice being piloted right now, and we can apply the same kind of principles where people don't just speak and fill in forms and respond directly to an institution, but they actually speak to each other and they deliberate and they share and they build their confidence, and as a result of that many of them will then be inspired to go and participate in uh, more formal structures. But the, the listening needs to happen, not just at the formal structures, it needs to be happening right in, in these uh, forums that uh, are set up for people to engage in. Thank you very much, Claire. I think 
one of the, the probably not surprising, but one of the, 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 the starkest comments in the survey responses was around boards feeling that they're powerless to make the decisions that need to be made. So I think everything we've heard is about um, a need for a more open and honest conversation, more engaging. So yes, the structures and systems we've got in place now, the clinical governance committees, the, the audit committees, for us, we would see those as, as, as really key committees. But there is still something that's getting in the way of organisations feeling that they're able to then take on some of the really tricky stuff. And it's for some of the reasons we've, we've talked about, you know, a challenging new environment that everyone's operating in, the integration of health and social care bringing together two very, very different cultures with different skills and experience. So there is definitely a period of working through some of those challenges. But I, I was just struck by the fact that, the, that some of the respondents have mentioned that they, f they still find it very difficult to, to sort of get over that line to take some of those challenging decisions. Um, so I think there's something there about what, what is it that they need to help them to do that. Some of it we've talked about today. Right. Some very good examples uh, of where there has been very good patient and public engagement. Um, in the main, though, this has tended to be very much you know, focused around specific conditions, diseases, whatever. Um, one thinks of some of the work that's gone on within the wider cancer field, diabetes, some of the heart disease issues as well. Uh, and I think that you know, within each local board, they will have their own specific examples. Part of the difficulty is that it is all very ad hoc and reactive. There is no standard methodology. Um, now, that may not necessarily be all be all bad, but the difficulty that does give you is it then makes it very difficult to evaluate it later on in the process, and it certainly makes it very difficult to compare and contrast what happens in one board area with another. I think the other thing that I would highlight from uh, that experience, certainly, that I've had uh, among those disease areas is that many of the very important decisions that are made um, are made without input from the board. You know, in many instances, they, the, what, what, the decisions that are made by, for example, uh, a diabetes managed clinical network with patient and public input may well be reported to the board, but the board's permission will not be sought. The board will not be uh, a major part of the decision-making process. And the boards actually tend to get involved in the more difficult, more contentious areas. But the vast majority of clinical processes, clinical services, um, the, 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 the decisions are made before the, with, without ever getting to the board particularly. I think as we're getting increasingly into health and social care, though, that is changing, and the IJBs clearly want to have much more of a hands-on role in that, uh, which I think is only right and proper given the complexity. Uh, but yet again, I, I think you know, that we're in danger of perhaps investing more in the boards uh, than they actually deliver or need to deliver. Thank you very much. Alice Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Convina. Good morning to everybody. Um, before I get to my question, I just wanted to put a marker down in support of what Emma Harper said about allied health professionals. I think we in this committee hear a lot, a lot about recruitment crisis, retention crisis, and particularly the GP profession, the nursing profession, but we often, I think, don't pay as much attention to what's going on in the AHP sector. So I think that when we bring um, the uh, safe staffing bill, things like it, through this committee. Uh, it's important that we reflect that those considerations. My question was in particular about failure demand and how that is met by the boards. And we've heard, obviously, we've heard a, a great deal about targets and missed targets and, and the response or lack thereof to individual boards across the country. And it re repeatedly strikes me that there is a siloed approach to this. There's not a, a, a sense of learning. When one health board... Uh, adopts an approach to a missed target and that succeeds, it doesn't seem readily then to be repeated in other health boards. Why is this? What is the problem with sharing best practice across the health boards and how do we get better at that kind of cross-fertilisation? Kendrick. Um, um, thank you for that, Alex. I, th I think um, particularly around uh, when we're looking at improving systems, it's a collaborative approach that we're gesturing towards, a collaborative approach that seems to be delivering results. And if, for example, you, you look at targets, if we looked, for example, at A&E services and we decide that we're not hitting the targets for seeing people within four hours, you could therefore have uh, an investigation into everything that's going on behind the hospital door. In other words, you know, how many staff do you have on at evenings and weekends and are we responding at the right time of the demand? But actually, 
what's really required is, we, we, looked, we, we, we discussed um, COPD earlier, um, respiratory, um, respiratory problems can be one of the main reasons that people are blue-lighted to A&E. Now, a respiratory flare-up can happen over a weekend, and if we can just get somebody the antibiotics on the Friday, they won't be blue-lighted to A&E on the Sunday. And we need to be thinking, therefore, about a whole service approach. This is very much what the allied health professions are talking about, and there is too much temptation still to use a model that's, that looks at where the symptom of the problem is, which is A&E, we don't have enough staff to hit the four-hour target, rather than a whole system approach which looks at why people are coming into A&E and is there anything we can do to prevent that, if that helps. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, I mean, just picking up the specific of your question, um, and also uh, Kendrick's key use of the word collaboration there, um, I would suggest that actually the current governance arrangements, board level governance arrangements, mitigate against collaboration. Uh, if you look at the way that um, boards are held to account, both in terms of performance, performance management, targets, resource allocation, collaboration is really driven by crisis. It's not driven by, let's realise some opportunities here. Uh, and there's actually a disincentive, I think, for boards to meaningfully collaborate on the front foot. The collaboration t usually happens too late in the day because much of the, particularly the performance management arrangement, uh, is about the delivery of short-term targets rather than consolidating services and developing uh, robustness uh, and sustainability going forward. Your, your, your point, I think, being that um, a different governance approach might produce a more collaborative culture between boards. Is that really what you're saying? In, in, indeed. So, uh, again, if I take some of the examples, again, which are real in my own recent experience, um, when you know, board A is perhaps struggling to deliver a service uh, and goes to board B saying, if we pooled resources, could we do this differently together? Board B's reaction tends to be, well, yes, that's very interesting, but were we to do that, it could compromise my performance. Uh, and therefore, uh, it, it, I say it mitigates against constructive collaboration uh, because the boards are each held to account for what happens in the short term on their patch. Clear. So I think there, there is something interesting happening in terms of the systemic issues facing the health system in Scotland now, which we highlighted in our overview report in October last year, uh, where boards are more inclined, I think, to look to each other now because of the difficulties that people are facing in terms of coming in on financial balance and trying to hit targets at the same time. So we've had quite a lot to say about the, the way that the targets influence the way that the health boards particularly operate. And I know that there's work underway to review how, that, how that's happening. But I do think integration coupled with some of the pressures around the system at the moment mean that the, the time is, is right. It feels a little bit more fertile, if you like, for people to be sharing and learning from each other. I do think, though, there's something that needs to be um, thought through a little bit more clearly in terms of what needs to be delivered differently in different parts of Scotland versus the things that actually can be done once for Scotland, can be done on a regional basis, and we're starting to see some of that be a bit more clearer now, or certainly will become clearer over the next wee while. Uh, so it's, there's certainly something else that needs to be paid attention to there, I think, for sure. Thanks very much. Slightly, I absolutely think the, the move towards regional planning and delivery is, is the right thing, um, but we still don't have a framework to hold regions to account. The framework still holds individual boards to account functioning as regions which are virtual constructs. That's a very important point, I think. Rachel? Yeah. Picking up on, on the last two speakers, I think what we are, you know, we've said before, we're in this very state of great state of flux in how services are being both delivered and governed at the moment. And the point is we have to have absolute clarity of accountability. You know, we're talking here about high-risk clinical interventions. We need to be really sure how, that deci how decisions about resources, about what services look like, we have to be really clear where those decisions are being made and who can be held accountable. We have a lot, we have a, I think uh, some, of the, some of the boundaries that we're used to are getting very blurred. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just as long as we have the frameworks to go with them. So with an integration, for example, you may have a, a, a health board with a number of integration authorities sitting beneath it with, where one of those integration authorities is hosting services for, a, for, for all of them. 
Uh, there are questions then about how those decisions are, are made for the entire population. You take it the other way, you get to the regional planning um, issues that are beginning to emerge, and you're back into a similar issue. Who, who holds the accountability for the decisions of what those regional services will be within the structures that we currently have, and what might we need to change to make those structures transparent and robust for the future? Thank you very much, Alex. I mean, I'm fascinated to hear that the construct is such that it's counterproductive to any efforts to collaborate, and, and the idea is, you know, that, well, not any efforts, but the idea that if, if we help you in this way, we might impede ourselves in another. Um, but also, we were struck in the, the example I was come back to is the health board, which is doing best in terms of cancer waiting time um, targets is systematically logging all the reasons for missed waiting, uh, for missed appointments or, or the delays in waiting times, and then mitigates against them and builds in a strategy for how that's not going to happen again. And it's working. And it just seems such a simple thing to do. And why is this not being picked up by other health boards? It's just one example. Um, but so I accept the point about the structural problem and the, the potential for um, health, you know, collaboration to be. Uh, impeding the work of another authority but on simple advice on simple sharing of good ideas are we really that far behind i don't think that there is really uh the correct impetus again the the correct framework if you like that really allows people to say let's all pursue the best of everything um because you know that if you like that is just part of a much bigger picture that has to be taken account of locally. Uh, and I think this is one of the things that is proving quite interesting uh, at regional level, uh, is that as more and more services are being deemed appropriate for a regional approach, what you're seeing is bits of service potentially being taken, about, taken out of uh, an individual board's control. Um, having to be then dealt with on a different level. Um, and whereas previously we've tended to have almost like 14 independent fiefdoms as territorial boards, this collaboration around certain issues is actually creating some quite significant challenges. I think it is the way forward. It has to be because we are increasingly lacking critical mass, particularly around certain hospital services, if we continue with the 14 board model. Um, but we, what we haven't done yet is get clever enough to develop the framework that promotes that, and that's the framework around governance, around performance management, and around resource allocation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Ash then. Thank you, convener. Um, during the course of this inquiry, we've had a number of submissions that sort of pointed to concerns that the public or stakeholders had had with the level of openness and transparency of boards. So I wanted to ask the panel if they think that that is justifiable. Is there a problem there with openness and transparency? Who would like to take on that one? The chair and then Claire. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a network of around 300 uh, people who have an active interest in openness and open approaches uh, to governance in Scotland. And uh, we kind of put the, 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 the call for this from this committee for evidence in that forum for the network. And we certainly got a lot of comments back, um, but I have to say all of the comments were negative in terms of uh, transparency and openness of NHS boards. And I noted that in the research that uh, is part of the papers uh, from SPICE, you know, it, it suggested that the boards themselves feel as though they are operating fairly uh, openly, but that the wider public may not, their, their perception is the wider public may not think so. So I think there is an, a recognition and understanding even within NHS boards that, uh, you know, there is a, a concern amongst the wider public about how open and transparent NHS boards are. Um, so, you know, given that everybody recognises it, I think uh, clearly there's an opportunity to do something about it. And I'm not quite sure uh, how much more research we probably need to do before we should just start cracking on and tackling the issues of openness and transparency. So yes, we've, we've signalled that in our recent report on, on the NHS that there's a, a need to be more open and transparent and have better and get levels of engagement with the, with the public, absolutely. Um, we are seeing with integration that that is starting to shine a bit of a different light on some of those issues. Um, so the very way that integration joint boards have been established, um, the, um, the Public Bodies Joint Working Act, means that there are duties that they need to be more open and transparent. So that is having an effect in terms of the NHS boards themselves, for sure. Uh, but there's more to be done. 
you. So obviously Audit Scotland, um, the recent overview report put forward a number of recommendations of things that boards could do. I'll just read out a couple of them. So publication of all board and committee uh, papers and minutes, public attendances at meetings, um, filling gaps in data in key areas, etc. And then obviously SCVO are currently working on the Open Government um, Partnership Action Plan. So I suppose at this point, where do we feel boards are with regard to these sort of recommendations and, or, and how far on do we think they are with the action plan or and where do we see that going in the short term? Sure. The action plan uh, is currently the, the one that the, the, the pilot action plan, which has just come to an end now, did not drill into that level of detail. I have to say. <coughs> However, the two year action plan, which I understand the government have, have committed to, and now there's a process behind that, uh, there is certainly there are a number of individuals in the networks, certainly on the civil society side, who have an interest in uh, specifically uh, tackling uh, openness and transparency around health in general, not sp not just NHS boards, but all the decisions that affect health and care uh, as part of the openness and transparency agenda and the action plan agenda for Scotland. So there's certainly a willingness and an interest on the side of many in, on, in civil society. And I, I sense there is potentially an interest uh, on the government side as well. But it, over the next uh, two, three months, uh, we will be uh, in a, within a process where those actions are put together. And you know, I, I hope that uh, this will come through as part of that. Thank you very much. In terms of the report, we will follow up on the recommendations that we made in that report. It's something that our local auditors in all of the, the NHS boards and integrated joint boards across Scotland will be also paying attention to and reporting on through their annual audit reports. We are just kicking off at the second of three pieces of work looking at integration in Scotland, um, and it's something we'll want to look at in more detail as part of that piece of work particularly, uh, to do a little bit of a drill down in certain areas in Scotland to understand how partnerships are working in terms of their openness and if there are lessons to be learned for elsewhere and we're hoping that we'll see some really good examples and we'll be able to highlight some of the things that are not working so well. Cool. Yeah, um, I think that transparency and accountability go pretty much hand in hand um, and it, it's where there is, isn't the ability to be represented at any level or at very few levels within boards that I think you will find the public feel you know, that they're not, uh, the board isn't being open and accountable because the only people that are sitting around the table are board representatives or, you know, the usual suspects, which we, we, we heard about before that, you know, quite often public appointees, etc. It's the same people on different boards, uh, different public bodies. Um, so it's, it's a closed club rather than an open uh, one. Um, having been quite critical with Highland, I would like to say that they in Mid Ross Community Partnership area, they have uh, set up a, a very innovative um, uh, community learning and development uh, peer uh, opportunity for disabled people to participate. Um, where you know a local NHS Highland board member, uh, the Community Planning Partnership, uh, etc., have have co-produced with disabled people in the groups. Um, an opportunity for somebody to go on to the local uh, community partnership and to support them in, in that. And that they want to see that broadened out to, to all the community partnerships throughout uh, Highland area. Um, but this is going back to the investment that's needed. You know, if you, know, you identify groups that are underrepresented, you need to actively do something to make sure that they're represented in the future. You can't just hope that somebody will come forward. You have to actually go out and, and work with those groups to find out what their interests are, what what they feel isn't being represented uh, within the local decision making, and and then work with them to make sure that those issues are are properly represented at you know local level first, and then building up. I think it is looking to transform things from the grassroots to the top rather than from the top down. Okay, thank you very much. Emma Harper. Um, thank you, convener. I'm interested in the, I guess, the transparency and the communication to members of the public. I know the IGBs are pretty much new, it's two years, but 
Yesterday I visited Stranraer with the cab sec and the people at Galloway Community Hospital feel as if the services are deteriorating or reducing when actually the services are being expanded locally uh, to mirror what's happening in, in Dumfries and Galloway, Royal Infirmary. So I'm interested in how information should be disseminated. Is it the board's job to do that? IJB, how would we make sure that people understand what models of care are, what new care is? All these words and language that's being used, I'm interested in how would we support that. Rachel. It reminds me of a piece of work that we did a few years ago around the role of the advanced nurse practitioner. And we did a number of case studies, which I'd be happy to share with the committee, looking at how communities had taken on the role of, uh, with advanced nurse practitioners in their area. And one of the, the ones in my mind as you're talking is one of our island communities where the advanced nurse practitioner service was going to be taking over out of hours care. And there was a great deal of opposition to that uh, as it started. And there was a huge amount of work done by that health board, taking them to another health board, picking up on the point about learning. They took them off to another health board where the service model, a similar service model on an island, had actually had a really good impact on the local community and took the community leaders along to, to meet people, to talk them through what this redesign of a service could look like for them and what it would actually mean. And when we interviewed community leaders uh, a couple of years down the line from that change having happened, they were incredibly supportive of the change, but it had required the effort to go and actually talk about why this actually could be an improvement to the service they'd had before rather than a reduction. I don't know that we're always as good as we could be at actually talking about when services are changing, how they can necessarily potentially improve things for communities rather than feeling like you're losing something that maybe you valued for some time. And there's probably more that we could do. But I think it goes back to that point that, that um, Alex Cole Hamilton was making about learning from other areas. There's much more that we could do there um, than we currently do. And I think that's a helpful example, which I'm happy happy to share further. <coughs> Thank you very much. Richard. Um, <coughs> one thing that we certainly be picking up is uh, the importance of being proactive rather than waiting for people to FOI decisions and uh, information that's been made available. And there's a very strong feeling now about that that we're picking up. Um, there's a really good example, actually, that, uh, in the work that Scottish Government is doing around identity assurance at the moment. And they're making use of uh, various structures within it within that, but as part of it, they're using the new, Scottish Government's new website for blogging about the, the discussions that take place on the various programme boards and stakeholder groups, but not just blogging about what they're doing, but opening it up for comments from the public, so people can put questions in, which everyone can see, so they, they can start to pick up, a, I mean, of course, it's all moderated, but, but people can see what other people are asking, and I think, you know, in terms of transparency, being able to see what others are asking so that you don't feel too afraid to ask that question yourself is really important as well. And it, that encourages the openness and transparency. It's not just a one-way process. Brian. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think there are two very important strands to the question about communication. One is, as you experienced down in the Fries and Galloway, there is something about how do you keep the local population informed about what's going on and why. Um, and one of the things that's been quite striking for me, particularly as we've looked uh, at bringing together resources around integration, is how little the average health board invests in communications. The communications departments are rudimentary, quite frankly, uh, even compared to the local authorities. Uh, and if one looked at what the public sector would be investing in there. Uh, now, I'm not sure the answer is necessarily to then create a communication uh, industry in each health board, but it maybe links to the second point that I was going to make, which is I think there is also the need for communication uh, at a super board level, possibly even a national level, about where health and social care is going and the benefits of it going in that particular direction, um, because as you know there is a huge degree of suspicion about any changes being synonymous uh, purely driven by financial reasons, cuts rather than because they represent a more effective, more sustainable, better model of care. But I think you know, when it's left to a health board to lead that discussion at the point of implementing a local change, quite frankly, it's too late in the day. Uh, we do need to have a, a, a much earlier conversation uh, about what we want from our health and social care service over the coming years. Thanks. Claire. I think this takes us back around to the earlier conversation about skills and experience, because what we're expecting here is it is a very different skill set than perhaps traditionally you would expect to be getting in many of the professions we're talking about. It's about a, an openness and a willingness to be challenged and to be more transparent and, and, you know, get things wrong sometimes, and that's okay. And I think we're expecting a different 
a different tone of engagement from our professions now and, and, and perhaps we haven't done enough to support people with that and or even to talk about that because it can work very well but it is quite tricky to do particularly around some really difficult decisions that need to be made um, so I think it's worth recognizing that when we're talking about the skills on boards and the skills in the various organizations actually some of this is, is fairly recent fairly new territory for some of those folk sure have to remember the pressure that the boards are under at the moment. So on the one hand, what we're asking is for boards to be at the heart of an enormous transformation agenda, which will result in services looking radically different over a number of years if, if, if boards are to meet the sorts of gauntlets that have been thrown down by the Scottish Government and by Parliament to, uh, to allow our services to change to meet demand. At the same time, we've been talking about targets, we've been talking about lack of resource, we've been talking previously in other committee uh, discussions around annual budgeting, the need to, you know, to break even at the end of every single year, and uh, a huge political pressure around meeting targets. And I think we have to bear in mind we're asking our board governors to do two things at the same time which are not always easily compatible. And that doesn't always leave them in an easy position when it comes to then having that open and honest conversation. Um, and I think if we don't acknowledge that here, then actually the culture that sets around the sorts of decisions and the way in which boards are being asked to make decisions sets them really between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. Bill? Yeah. Uh, I think it's in interesting, the word that you used earlier, uh, Brian, about um, informing people, because I think that's not enough. <laughs> I think that's how consultation has, has largely taken place up until now. Boards have informed people this is what's going to be happening and asked them to understand why, that, why that's happening. What you need to do is involve them from the outset in asking them what do you want from the health service and how do we collectively deliver what you want. Now, you're going to get, you, you have to limit their expectations in that. You have to tell them what the situation is, what you have to deliver at the moment, what your resources are. It's a, it's a big, big question. But actually, without co producing, without actually trusting people with the information and then trusting them to make meaningful choices about options that are presented to them, you're not going to develop the health service in a way that properly meets the needs of a modern 21st century society. Um, because you have, to, you have to trust them that once they're informed, they will begin to own the choices that are made rather than be told about the choices that have been made for them. Because if they own the choices, they understand the limitations that are then there. Whereas before, all they can see is my local hospital is closed or that service that I relied on has moved 20 miles away. Why? You know, because it, they were just told it's, it's a good thing for you. They need to believe that it was the right choice. And to, to, to believe it's the right choice, they have to be involved from the outset. And so do the representatives in arriving at what the choices were uh, that were offered to them, rather than just being told that it's this or nothing. Yeah. Thank you very much. Moving towards the end of the session, but we have a question from Alison Johnson. Um, yes, thank you, convener. I think it's it's picking up on earlier points that have been made. Um, I, I think Rachel um, Kakett pointed out that boards are under pressure to meet both targets, um, you know, clinical targets, which uh, written submissions have suggested can often feel unrealistic and can even demoralise staff. And at the same time, they have to meet these targets on reduced budgets and we've some of the submissions um, that, that we've received have expressed a lack of trust that boards make decisions in the best interests of the public and one of the submissions there's there's a real frustration there uh, there was some recognition that decisions were constrained by finances and in relation to openness and transparency one respondent wrote we are terrible at admitting that we're financially constrained and pretend that decisions are based on clinical grounds, when in most cases they're based on clinical staffing and financial elements. Um, the debate with the public is therefore fundamentally dishonest, and it says, and the public are not stupid. <laughs> now, I think openness and transparency would help if, if people understood why a decision had been reached at. Um, so there's a, I think the openness and transparency question comes into this very much, but how can these competing 
pressures, scarce resources and, and the wishes of the public be balanced to result in decisions that are acceptable to all? Or is it simply too big an ask? Brian. Um, I, I would further complicate the, the way you've described it by saying it's it feels more like a triangle and at the three corners of the triangle you've got quality of care, uh, which is paramount in my view. You have performance, which is basically about targets, uh, and the third one you have resources, which is about money, people, buildings, all the rest. And the real challenge currently is can you keep that triangle level? Can you balance across these three? Uh, and there's a, a fair degree of compromise going on. I think there is probably a, a degree of naked emperor in there as well, in terms of the, the reality of the financial situation. Um, but what we are, I think, increasingly seeing is that in the attempt to maintain and enhance the quality of care within a finite budget, the thing that is currently most likely to suffer is the ongoing delivery of the current targets. Uh, and I think to do that does need the kind of conversation we've been talking about through the whole of this morning, which is about we're in a new world now. Um, are, are there different ways that we could actually seek to, to challenge this problem? Uh, I think a lot of it comes back to the point I made earlier on, which is that we're actually in the very fortunate position currently of we've got so much that we can offer uh, within the confines of health and social care that it's now exceeding the, the budget that's available to deliver it. Uh, and that's where the difficult choices start to come in. Rachel. I think it touches on a number of things that we've, we've discussed this morning. I think the importance of making sure that the different arms of governance have equal weighting is really, really important because if, if the discussion becomes so heavily weighted towards the financial savings targets that boards are finding themselves having to make as our IJBs, then actually what we end up with is a skewed dis discussion, which the, the issue of quality of care, which I, I would agree with Brian, is, has to be up there in the services that we're talking about, can easily get lost. And we can't allow that to happen. So we have to make sure that the boards are giving equal weight across the system to both of those discussions. So I think that really matters. The issue of targets and what we describe as good performance, I think we still need to come back to. Because I agree, the pressure on, on those... Um, does mean that it's not always easy to have the sorts of conversations that you might want to have about long-term transformation. And that's really the ball game that we have to be in now, is what does long-term transformation uh, mean? You asked, um, are we going to satisfy everyone? Um, almost certainly not. But that's where the openness and transparency and the sorts of discussions that Rishi has been having around how you involve people, and it's not that everyone's going to have to agree, but at least there's a sense of actual proper participation. And I would put that for staff as well as for the public, that participation of the people who were both receiving and delivering services is really key. Um, and that's the only way that we're going to be able to go forward. And we do have to set this within the political context. The NHS, politically, will always be at the heart of so many people and we have to be aware of some of the political pressures that will be there in terms of what this might mean for the future. It's, you know, that's the landscape that we also work in, which now includes local government through IJBs, of course. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a number of things that we can do, but making sure that we are looking at how we're talking about performance, understanding what we mean success is, ensuring that there is genuine participation. Brian brought up the issue of managed clinical networks previously and, and the way in which they are transforming and have transformed services without even necessarily having to go through the formal governance processes. When we were doing our work around how we might rethink what success looks like for health and social care services, one of the models that we were interested in was what managed clinical networks have done by collaborating and, and using participation to come up with ways to improve the sorts of services that are being delivered for people. So I think there are ideas out there, there are things that we could do, but we are working with huge constraint on resources um, and the political pressure that comes with, with an NHS. Clear. So I think part of the answer here has to be if we look to try and continue to do what we've always done with the current resources and the staff we can get, because some of the posts we know can't be filled, um, then it's not going to work. So we do need a different model, and health and social care integration must be part of the answer to that, I think. One of the things we've maybe not 
talked about today and is worth mentioning is the focus on outcomes so what difference any of this is actually making to people and we're seeing some really healthy conversations starting to happen now I think between clinicians who are enabled to have an open conversation with folk about you know do you really want to continue that treatment is that right for you now that brings all sorts of tensions in terms of hitting certain waiting times targets and what performance actually means in that context when your care might be very different to the care that works for you so it's opening up a whole range of different variables there that we've not really had to deal with before so I think a focus on outcomes and also an acknowledgement that at the heart of this some of this is not for the health system to fix you know some of this is about uh, access to the right housing to issues to do with education to do with welfare issues so that sense of broadening that out that again integration is starting to open up some of those conversations it's not just about how the acute hospitals are operating it's is the shift to prevention happening fast enough and how do we make a, a little bit more space for that to happen? Awesome. Well, yes, perhaps if Kenrick was going to, to address this next, I'd be interested in the written submission from the AHPs. It points out that the average adaptation costs £2,800. And if you don't make that adaptation, you can end up spending £7,500 as a result of all sorts of other things. So it's about that shift to prevention too. But I'd just like to understand where in the governance process are we looking at whether or not that kind of saving is happening. Well, I would just yeah, absolutely <coughs> reflect on the discussion we have. What we have is a system which is under pressure to make short-term decision-making on declining <coughs> budgets very often, in which they're looking at a very restricted aspect of where that budget is spent and how it can be shaved. And in fact, what the system needs is long-term future planning to transform services so that we're reducing the demand where we can and we're supporting the population to get the right outcomes. And in order to achieve all that, we do need this whole system thinking. And, and yes, we, we have continually seen examples where the investment in a preventative service would save money, but it saves money off somebody else's budget. And for that reason, there's never the incentive to instigate it. Now, we have, as, uh, uh, as, as allied health professionals, continually pointed at this and said, well, look, this is where if you could just provide us with this budget, we could save all this money. Um, but there's never the incentive to deliver on that. When we get pilot schemes that demonstrate the clinical and cost effectiveness of these, they're often done with centralised money from the Scottish Government to fund initiatives, and the minute that that initiative funding ends with the expectation it will become embedded in a service, the service is dropped. Not because it hasn't worked, not because it hasn't proved itself to be effective, clinically and cost effective, but because it was extra money that is now no longer in the budget. And these kinds of decision making need to be changed and they need to be challenged. And where are the AHPs in this? Well, what we're seeking, I think, as, as allied health professions is just a parity of esteem around let's get the right professionals around, around the table to make the right decisions in the interests of the people we're serving and not thinking about things in terms of the budget or the short term, but in fact, how we can deliver lasting improvements by getting sometimes different people to offer a slightly different service but achieve a better outcome for all involved. Brian. Yeah, we've talked a lot, understandably, about resources here, um, but I, I would make the fairly bold comment that the long-term answer is not more money. Um, the resources that we currently have, uh, or the resource challenges that we currently have, uh, are as much to do with people and facilities as they are to do with money. Uh, and in fact, we, in, in some instances, are unable to buy the things we need. We can't find the people we need to employ. We cannot use the money that's there. But I think the other money challenge that we have just now is that we're spending a lot of it very inefficiently, very ineffectively. We are not achieving good value for that expenditure. Uh, as an example, you know, the number of people that we are keeping in acute hospital beds who don't need to be there, where for a fraction of the cost we could be providing home care packages or nursing home beds. Um, the amount of money that we're spending on staff, locum staff, for example, to sustain services that really are yesterday's model. Um, so I think it really is the transformational change that Claire and others have been referenced to all morning. Uh, and I think 
I hope the discussions like this one will give us the, uh, another platform to really get into that territory uh, about how we need a different sustainable model for health and social care going forward. A brief final supplementary from Brian Fiddle. Yeah, thank, thank you. It's just to, to, to <coughs> add to uh, Kendrick's submission there around, um, it seems to me that, that we come across this all the time, there's these little pilot schemes that come along, prove that we can spend less money and get better outcomes and, 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 the, and, the, and sort of the whole holistic, if you like, the, the big budget. And yet when it comes to the end of the pilot scheme, it ends up on a shelf, which I've got to say for person, I find that massively frustrating. There's a very good one in the, uh, the Cross House Hospital in the stroke uh, rehabilitation where you have six weeks of stroke rehabilitation usually, and then they take that into the community. And that's, they have proven that the, the uh, recurrence of stroke and, and the re-emission of stroke uh, is, 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 is far reduced with that process. And yet, that ends up back on the shelf. Now, that just, just doesn't seem logical to me. How do we get to a point where those kinds of, of um, initiatives uh, are, are, are adopted much more uh, across the board when, the, when it's proven to work? What we actually need is a whole system buy-in to change because very often pilot schemes are initiated with a particular service looking at a particular model wanting to change to a, a better model. We'll get that investment from a third-party source. But if we're going to be saving, so for example, in the example you used, I mean, those rehabil that rehabilitation in the community, what that can be saving is a fortune for ongoing social care if you can get somebody to rehabilitate to the point where they can remain independent in their own home for longer. Because that is a major drag on, on, on resource is going to be an aging population that is, is, is lacking independence. And if we can provide people with that independence, then that's the first, the, the first priority. But to do that means spending money before they require social care and therefore <laughs> how do you get the whole system to recognise that cost saving when the service that's providing that is going to actually spend more money to save everybody else from intervening? Thank, you very, th thank, thank you very much. Uh, we've, we've had a good session this morning on, on accountability and scrutiny and, and we've acknowledged, I think, that there's an increasing focus of services at the regional level and no mechanisms yet in place for achieving that at a regional level. As a final, final question, is there anything we should be thinking about or saying to government about improving a, a accountability and scrutiny in existing territorial boards, yes, but with an application to the regional level as that develops? Clear. So the Scottish Government is currently developing a financial framework to underpin the 2020 vision. Um, we think that's really important part of the answer. Um, the connection between the policy aspiration and what that actually means for local areas has been the thing that has been missing in this, I think. Um, so people understand, everybody's signed up to the overall vision, but trying to realise that in practical terms has been very, very difficult for all of the reasons we've talked about. So we are really interested to see what that financial framework looks like because it should set out the steps that need to be taken to get to realising the vision that's been set out. So it speaks to that, that term you mentioned, long-term financial planning, long-term planning in the round. We think that's part of the missing picture. Rishir. Um, I totally agree and with, with about the systems change approach to this, you know, looking at the wider system. We, but in order to do that, we're going to need to change our frame of reference at the highest level. Uh, fortunately, we do have a new frame of reference we can use, and that is the Sustainable Development Goals. And at the moment, the Scottish Government is uh, working at the, on the National Performance Framework. It's going to be laid in front of Parliament um, in a, shortly. Um, and as part of that, they're integrating the National Performance Framework with the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, what the Sustainable Development Goals allows us to do is to start looking at this from a more preventative lens, from a system-wide lens. How does tackling improved health outcomes relate to tackling poverty, tackling climate change, gender equality? and a whole range of other things, education. So by looking at it from that lens, uh, we can start to not just talk about systems, which will put a lot of people off, but actually have a, a, a very concrete frame of reference that's internationally recognised, that the Scottish Government is committed to, that national performance framework is being integrated with, and that can provide a wider context for tackling health. 
Thank you very much. And can I thank all the witnesses who have attended this morning? It's been a very useful and wide-ranging session and will certainly inform our ongoing inquiries. Thank you very much. We'll now move into private session.